Good morning. Why were three business immigration applications, two from Iran, one from China, being refused by the Canadian immigration authorities? And how Canadian federal court reacted to these refusals? Our expert panels will, will be discussing this and sharing their insights. So stay tuned, watch until the end. Just a quick reminder before we start. Please know that whatever you hear in these live sessions or any content you see on social media by Savi Rob's law firm is general information only and not legal advice. While we may use certain real life scenarios or legal cases for learning purposes, it is important to remember that this does not constitute a legal opinion. For personalized legal advice, please consult with your lawyer or hire a Canadian immigration lawyer. Now, let's get back to our show. Welcome back. And today's topic, as we said, three cases from federal court, three refusal on business immigrations. These are not our clients, thanks God, but we will learn a lot of insights from these cases of federal court. And today I'm joined by two guests, uh, Benjamin Wilhelm, who is an associate at Sobirov's law firm, and Owen Angus Yamada, who is a business plan specialist. So gentlemen, welcome to you both. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Rachman. Thanks for having us, Rachman. Ben, let's start with some basics. Why, why these cases or similar cases are taken to Federal Court of Canada in terms of immigration litigation? Yeah, so these cases are taken to the Federal Court and they go through a process that's called judicial review. This happens when a case is refused, but you know the lawyers and the applicants disagree with the reasons for refusal. And so instead of maybe resubmitting the application, uh, you want to challenge it with the federal court who's not the IRCC. And that's one of the benefits. You know, It's not going to the same people. It's going to the court rather than uh, Immigration Canada. And for the benefit of our audience, can you please describe the notion whether the decision of IRCC or immigration authorities, the Canadian embassies and consulates, they can be challenged in the court, right? Just to give a, an overview for those who, who think that visa, visa decisions or refusals are final and cannot be challenged. Yeah, sometimes you hear, you know, legal language saying it's a final decision. What that really means is it's just closing the application with uh, Immigration Canada, but that doesn't mean it's the end of the line for an applicant. You can still take it to court or you can still resubmit. And so um, for judicial review, that's just one of the options available. Excellent. So these cases from Federal Court of Canada, they, they were decided in June, July of this year. So they are very fresh. They will, these cases will help us to know the thought process of Federal Court and how they analyze a decision of refusal. So let's get started with the cases. So case number one today we have is Ardestani versus Canada. A very fresh case from, from this year, summer, June, July of 2023. So to give a background of the case, what we say facts of the case, I'll just give a background and then I'll, I'll uh, pass it to Benjamin to analyze it. So uh, there was an Iranian citizen who was applying for a business immigration work permit under C-11 significant benefit work permit. He wanted to establish a livestock consulting service in the Metro Vancouver area in British Columbia. Application for work permit was submitted in August of 2021. The work permit was denied in March of 2022 by the embassy in Ankara, Turkey. Roughly eight months of processing time, which is quite long, to be honest. Uh, and judicial review application was dismissed by the federal court. So now let's get into the details of the case. Benjamin, can you give us the highlights of the case from your perspective? What had happened here? Yeah, so this was a case where um, if you look at the reason for refusal, the officer refused this case because they weren't satisfied that the applicant had temporary intent or what that means is they weren't satisfied that the applicant would leave Canada when their work permit was done. Um, it can be kind of confusing. Applicants see that and they're like, what do you mean I'm not going to leave Canada? I've got my parents who are still living at home. I've got, you know, business at home. All of my qualifications are at home. Um, 
And in this case, rather than picking on kind of those factors, you know, the family and the employment abroad and those sort of things, uh, the issue was with the business plan. The officer didn't think that uh, the business plan proposed was reasonable. They didn't really believe that the applicant's uh, genuine intention behind the business plan was to establish this business. They thought they were using it just to come to Canada and that they weren't going to pursue the business. Okay, that's a good summary of the visa officer's notes and the position that visa officer took in, in this work permit application. Let's go into more detail, Ben. I know that the, the angle of attack, the, the weakest link in the whole application, the officer attacked the business plan. Oh, can I take, can I have your take on this case and specifically on the business plan that was submitted? So in terms of the case itself, I think that the, the elements of the business plan need to be fleshed out a bit more. And I think you can do that a lot through market research and also just making sure that a lot of uh, the facts that are aligning, that are presented in the case align. So I think one of the, the complaints that they had or the, one of the notes of the officers uh, was that the revenues were not well explained. Uh, in other cases, I've seen them use the word saying like it's speculative and, you know, Typically, when we think of like investors, you know, you think of speculative investing. I heard an interesting quote, I uh, actually read it in a book that was, you know, if you don't have a level of analysis, you're not speculating, you're just guessing. And I think that that's kind of, uh, you know, a generous term for the officers to say, because if you're just putting down a number and saying, you know, in year one, I will just make 500000 or I think in this case, it was like $260,000. Uh, without any kind of background or any sort of uh, analysis to support that or any rationale, uh, you know, it, you're not really even speculating on what you're going to make. You're really just throwing a number and guessing. And I think the optics from the officer's perspective is that if you don't have that background information, you're not actually serious about it. Now, whether or not that's true, I mean, that's case by case, but I think that's kind of what the optics uh, are. And I think that's why it kind of got flagged at, as a, a rejected case. So. There were uh, salaries projected, right? And the uh, officer says projected salaries and related expenditures in Metro Vancouver area were low. So let's go into more details. What, what would you expect uh, in, a, in a business when you, wanna, when you want to do a business in Vancouver, an expensive area? And what, what's your take on that, Ben? <laughs> yeah, uh, especially for rent. I mean, something that we're learning from this case is that the officer is going to take a look and they're going to do their own research about rent. They're going to figure out, you know, what is average rent? Is it, uh, in this case, $8,160? Or, you know, is it higher per year? Um, which can be a challenge for some applicants, you know, because they're not in Canada yet. And so if officers wants to see that you've actually rented space, well, why would you rent space if you're not in Canada? And so it can be a hard thing to balance sometimes. Yeah, the main question, Owen, was that how would you achieve that revenue? And, and the word how was always featuring in, in the officer's uh, notes. So how would a foreign entrepreneur project correctly or using your words, speculate correctly to satisfy the visa officer's requirements? So in this case, when we're talking about livestock, uh, you know, you might want to do a comparable uh, business, but that's very niche. So it's going to be very difficult for you to, you know, compare against another existing business or, uh, you know, they actually have a lot of industry performance metrics available from the government of Canada, which is a nice kind of benchmark to be able to evaluate whether or not your financials are reasonable. I think in this case, you'd want to be able to determine what pricing you would have uh, and, you know, logically why you would do it based off of things like your target uh, target market and your competitors. And then you'd want to try to forecast like how much hours each project would be. And so I think that would be pretty a pretty good way to be able to just set some sort of baseline to show, you know, this is how we're going to achieve this number. Uh, and it's pretty, again, it might be a little rudimentary. Uh, the more information you have, the better you're able to make those sorts of estimates. I, I think in this case, it's kind of a difficult situation, but it, you got to do something rather than nothing. The officer specifically mentioned the following, no details on how the business would realize full market share in the first year and how the projected revenue of $260,000 would be achieved. What, what's your take on, on these numbers and analysis of the officer? 
Yeah, I think what the officer is asking for is just more information here. They wanted the applicant to go further into detail about the, uh, you know, market analysis. They wanted the applicant to provide, you know, uh, maybe contacts from inside of Canada saying, hey, you know, we're interested in your business. This is how much we would pay sort of thing. They wanted more. How would you address a lack of experience in livestock uh, consulting, livestock uh, consulting service? When you when applicant doesn't really have any experience in that, and how would you connect it to to the background of the applicant? Well, I mean, ideally, uh, depending on you know if this was a client I'd be working with, I want to be able to explore how that idea came about. Uh, you know, if that was just some idea that maybe they heard from a friend uh, being a potentially good idea in Canada, then I think I would want to kind of reshape uh, the business focus to something that you know is in a growing market. And so, like, I'm, I'm not really sure about the applications. I, I've been to the Vancouver area. I don't know how many farms there are out there. I think there's different parts of Canada that would uh, fit better with uh, that sort of business model. Uh, and then also try to fit something that you know relates to their experience and something that they'd be feel comfortable doing. Uh, I mean, in this case, you know, I, I don't have that interaction with the client, so I don't know that background information. But I, I would try to address that earlier on in the process uh, rather than you know take all those inputs and then just try to to you know fit a uh, a square peg through a round hole, uh, in that case. But if I did have to work with it a little bit more, I guess we tried to really look at any sort of the experiences that the client have that we can really uh, relate to the livestock consulting business. Because obviously that idea, you know, at some point had to resonate to them for some reason or the other. Maybe they like grew up on a farm. Uh, or maybe you know they uh, you know worked in some sort of agricultural industry and had seen that uh, hap applied or worked with uh, other livestock consultants, so they have a secondhand knowledge of that. And I think that's something that we can take and extrapolate for further. But at the same time, you know, like it's best not to even get into that situation where you have to maybe uh, try to tr try to make some more tenuous connections there. And you really want to be able to set your client up for success. And that really means like objectively looking at the business idea at the very beginning rather than you know, later down the line. And also, the, of course, then the officer says, I'm not satisfied that the requirements of the LMI exemption have been met. Can you please run us through the basic requirements of such an LMI exempt category as C11 work permit, significant benefit? So the C11 work permit is one of the broadest work permits um, if you're an entrepreneur or if you're self-employed. So... The IRCC has recently kind of split it into two definitions, entrepreneur and self-employed. That basically revolves around whether you're hiring just yourself and your family members or you intend to hire other people as well. Um, beyond meeting one of those definitions, they also want to see significant benefits to Canada, which is kind of the open-ended aspect of it. Uh, what officers really want is you can just show like, how are you going to help Canadians? How is your business going to succeed here? Is there a need for your business and why? So under section 205, a work permit may be issued under the section 200 to a foreign national who intends to perform work that would create or maintain significant social, cultural, econ or economic benefits or opportunities for Canadian citizens or permanent residents. So the key word here is economic benefit, isn't it, in this case? Yeah, absolutely. The key is economic benefit in this case. Um, and I'm kind of surprised because this is a livestock consulting business, right? And there are a lot of programs designed specifically for, um, you know, farming in Canada. And so it seems like this business would have really great significant benefits. Um, but that wasn't the reason for refusal. What's the significance of a location in a business uh, immigration application? Um, Location is important because maybe there are other businesses located near you that offer the exact same services. Maybe it's a competitive space, or maybe if you move somewhere, maybe it's not. Maybe uh, your business can offer that significant benefit to Canada just based on location, just because there aren't businesses in this area. And that's something that you need to research and prepare in advance. There is a, basically a list of eight questions that officers look into that, by the way, publicly available on, on, on the internet, you can benefit in your analysis of your business immigration application, or it's, it ignites the thought process of how this uh, business immigration application works. So the next case is Zargar versus Canada, another case from federal court, and another applicant from Iran. 
So Ben, can you give us quick facts of the case, please? Yes, absolutely. So this was another C11 work permit. So it was the same program as the last one, also an entrepreneur. So this was a person not just hiring themselves um, or their family members. They were hiring other people and their business was a fitness club also in Vancouver. So can you give us more about the, and how the analysis proceeded with, the, with this application? So if you look at the officer's notes, the officer, um, as they you know always do for this type of application, looked at who are we hiring um, and what are the major costs. And so like Rachman said, um, the renting space was an issue in this case. The officer, again, didn't think that the amount that they would pay for rent was realistic. They kind of contested those numbers by doing their own research. To give you more perspective, I will quote from the case. Uh, the officer says, despite the very um, despite the very small size of the operation, projected revenues in the first year are over three hundred eighty thousand dollars, increasing to over six hundred thousand dollars in year five, without an increase in fitness trainers. Now, from the business plan perspective, I will bring Owen into the conversation. Owen, what's your take in this case? Yeah, I think the the biggest issue with this case based off of the officer's notes is the and i know she had a lot of uh different uh no different flags uh with the case but i think the biggest one was the matching between revenues and expenses you know a lot of times you want to take an optimistic view for the the revenues and i think that's like natural you want to be able to present the business as being a very viable uh very profitable uh and so you know sometimes you'll take the revenues and you maybe inflate them a little bit more than you should, or sometimes you take the expenses and you take a very uh, generous, you know, hopeful approach that the expenses aren't going to be that high. I, I typically, I don't advise really doing that because, you know, obviously there's going to be, you know, everyone knows there's going to be some level of, uh, you know, subjectivity on how you determine that. But if you're really inflating your uh, revenues and decreasing your expenses at the same time, it's going to cause some flags because if people are, you know, going to be thinking like, how are you going to be achieving these revenues while also remaining so minimal on your expenses. And so, you know, like it, typically as you grow as a business, you're going to have more expenses because you're going to have to, you know, incur more, even from like just a administrative or insurance uh, aspect, like you're going to have to take on more of a burden. Uh, and so you're really, your financials should reflect that. It should be a very cohesive, uh, you know, representation of all of the texts that came before it. Um, and so, if it's not a cohesion and doesn't really explain the text well, it's going to raise a lot of concerns. And again, last quote uh, from the case that I want to highlight is in, in paragraph 14. Um, the court says, a finding that the business plan was not sufficient on some key metrics is an assessment within the officer's discretion. Please explain why court really focused on the obligation of visa officer in reviewing the business plan in this case. Yeah, so I think that's actually uh, like a really underlying um, factor in all of the judicial cases I've reviewed thus far or like in the last few months. Um, you know, this one actually explicitly said that the officer does not have the, op or is not obligated to review it or, or you really make any sort of guesses for it. And I think that's really saying that the burden of proving the business plan being adequate uh, and sufficient for uh, you know the venture and and having enough detail and enough research behind it is really on the applicant. Uh, you cannot expect the officer to make those like logical conclusions for you. You have to really spell it out, uh, and so you really can't just you know maybe in this case put like some amount and and have the officer sort of logically process you know oh you know get into your head and think about how you would do it. Uh, really, they're going to just take the baseline assumption that, you know, that they see, especially in this case, a gym, they, they see a gym operate. They know that as gyms get bigger, they have more staff. And so they're going to assume that to be the case. Maybe that doesn't apply in this case to this for some whatever reason, but it's not really the officer's uh, responsibility to, you know, to try to understand it from the applicant's standpoint. It really should be the applicant's responsibility to make the officer understand. So this is why the details of business plan are very, very important. It's not just putting the numbers down on a paper. It's explaining how you arrived to these numbers. Why? On what basis you are projecting this amount or that amount? So what was the outcome of the case, Ben? 
This case was again refused, and again for the same reasons. They didn't think that the intended employment was reasonable, so um, it was refused for purpose of the visit again. So the next case we have is, and the last case we will analyze today, is Yang versus Canada. Again, very fresh case, but the facts are a little bit different. Uh, but the theme has, is, is there. The same theme continues. So it's a case of a 35-year-old citizen of China wanted, who wanted to establish a food exporting company in Prince Edward Island. In 2020, the applicant applied to the PEI's Provincial Nominee Program. A business plan prepared by Grant Thornton LLP and dated and was dated in June uh, 2021. So it was, as you can see, it was an older business plan. In June 2022, the PEI Office of Immigration approved the applicant as a Provincial Nominee candidate and provided a letter of support for the applicant's C-11 work permit application. So again, C-11 work permit, but in the context of a provincial nominee program, okay? Uh, IRCC received the applicant's work permit application in August 2022. So the business plan was in June 2021, but the application in a year after, almost more than a year after in 2022. So let's take uh, what Ben thinks about this case. I think one of the themes that we've talked about is location, and we see that again come up in this case. The officer comments that they're not sure how the business is going to succeed because the applicant hasn't shown, you know, why the skills they offer distinguish themselves from all of the, you know, the Canadians that are already uh, conducting these businesses. The officer wanted to see, you know, why here and why can you distinguish yourself here? And there was a peculiar situation in this case that the applicant has never visited PEI, right? She did not make a visit, take a visit to PEI, and she didn't really know the location. It was mostly conducted online, as the court mentions, the research about the business and so on. So what's the importance of visiting a location in your mind, Ben? Well, I think that the importance of visiting the location is just making sure you know the market, make sure you know the business that you're getting into. Um, I think that some applicants can sometimes be, uh, you know, a little frustrated because you're applying for, you know, your temporary residence visa. And so the officer is saying, you know, why don't you have one already? Why haven't you been here already? Um, and that's what you're doing for the first time. But uh, if you can't come to Canada right away, and if you can't get, you know, a temporary resident visa to come and visit, I think that the main takeaway is just make sure that you know the market and make sure that you show that in the business plan. Owen, let's again analyze from the business plan perspective. Yeah, so I think there are a few points uh, there. I think kind of one of the ones that I thought was really interesting was that they had a business plan prepared by another organization, uh, but that they actually didn't update it between the time from when it was initially rejected to the time that they were resubmitting it. Uh, and I think that that's going to obviously raise some flags because, you know, you had some time to be able to, I think it was about a year since it was initially prepared to when it was submitted and there was no substantial changes made. It wasn't even, didn't even change the date on it. And so I think that that's going to kind of create questions about the legitimacy of the applicant in that case. You know, if you're a genuine app applicant, you are not just doing a business plan. You know, you are actually going to be taking actions, you know, after you've written the plan or even during the time you're writing the plan to be able to get yourself in a position to run the business. And, you know, you really should be reflecting that, especially if you have a year, you should be able to update your plan and reflect those actions that you are taking in preparation. And your failure to do that just makes it seem like they're not really that genuine about the venture. What's the importance, in this case, it was highlighted a bit that the client that the applicant never visited PEI. What's the importance in your mind visiting the place, seeing the market for, for himself or herself? In general, I'd probably advise uh, anyone, you know, especially that this isn't just a business venture, but also a personal venture. So you want to make sure that where you're moving to is somewhere that you would actually feel comfortable living, especially for like a PNP case. Uh, and so I, like I would recommend it generally in most circumstances to be able to do it. Again, there are some like s situations where maybe it's a... Uh, a type of business where being in person isn't as, is important uh, or is the applicant to someone who's just maybe more uh, well-traveled that uh, they understand that the, the climate that they're getting into. 
In this case, there was a support letter from PEI Office of Immigration. But another practical way to know more about the, the market is to get into uh, higher professionals, get into the contact with local businesses, and try to do as much as you can in your circumstances without visiting the location. And mention that in your submission too, that you tried from a distance, you tried your best to learn about the, the realities of the market and address how you will uh, compete with other competitors. Because the, the, the analysis here, Ben, was about the competitors that already existed in this food exporting market, wasn't it? Yeah, that was exactly the comment. I think that was kind of the big one for the officer here. It's just the market was competitive. Also, Ben, can you uh, focus on the the prospect of hiring Canadians and Canadian res permanent residents? And it was mentioned in the officer's notes too. Yeah, we see it pretty much in all of the notes. Um, officers are always turning their mind to who are you hiring. And I think that this kind of goes to the underlying uh, purpose behind the C-11 work permit. It's, it's an LMIA exemption. And what an LMIA normally would do is kind of assess how it would affect the uh, Canadian employment market. How um, is this business going to hire people that need jobs? And so if nobody needs jobs in the area or you're not able to show that, then the officer is going to say, well, why would we give you an LMIA exemption? Okay. And officer also criticized the, the business plan and because it was unclear how the applicant would distinguish herself in this crowded market, in this literally red ocean, right? Red ocean market, how would you differentiate yourself if you were to go into a very competitive market? In a very competitive market, you really need to understand a lot about your uh, competitors and where they're pricing, where they're, um, where they're, uh, sorry, where they're, where they're pricing is, how they position their products, how they even market and advertise themselves and which and which customers are they going after. And you can really differentiate yourself in any of those different factors because you can sell at a different price, you can go for a different uh, target market, you can position and sell your products in different channels if you need to. So, I mean, in this case, it's kind of hard because I don't have all the facts in it. Uh, and so it's hard for me to say you know, how I differentiate it, but I think it's an incredibly important point that they flagged because if there's no competitive advantage, there's really no identified need for the business. And finally, Owen, let me take your your ideas on hiring that was mentioned uh, in the business plan. That was not mentioned in the business plan, but criticized again by the visa officer. The hiring plan, how important it is in these type of applications and uh, how clients should go about it. Yeah, so... I mean, the hiring plan is important to be able to show that you are logically thinking about how your business is going to grow and what that's going to look like. I, you know, I, I think when we talk to clients uh, and you know, everyone understands that the hiring plan is at our current time, what our best estimates with the future would look like. Obviously, in reality, things could look a little different based off of how well your business is doing. So if you're growing very quickly, you're probably going to hire a lot quicker. And if uh, you know growth is a little slower, you might you know delay some hiring of certain key positions as well. So you know having a hiring plan though in general, it just shows that you have thought these things through. And so like the financial projections I mentioned before, it's like the absence of it just kind of shows that you're not really serious about the venture because you're not actually thinking these through. Whether or not that's actually true to the the case of files, I can't comment on, but that's what the perception is. And so when you're when you're putting forward the plan. You're really doing both a mental exercise for yourself to think about where your where your business is going to be in the next you know three years, but you're also kind of showing to the officer that you have done your homework and that you are serious about this because you know you could be serious about this and not do it, but it doesn't come across like that. And so you want to make sure that you're putting the right image for us and you're signaling that you are a genuine applicant for the program you're applying to. Great. Now, let me get your tips for our international audience who are watching this video today. Yeah, I, I think the first one I like is that it is on the applicant to be responsible to clearly outline all, all of the details very explicitly and not just assume that the officer is going to understand. Uh, number two is in that process, you want to be able to take action. Uh, and so a lot of times you want to be able to take action and collect research, do as much research as you possibly can. 
I, you know, and you also want to balance that along with the kind of program you're going with as well. And so that's where a lot of uh, immigration law firms can help uh, kind of direct you in the right direction to, you know, depending on what program you need, you might need a certain level of threshold of research put into it. But at the very minimum, you need some level of research or some level of rationale to support what you're going to be saying in your business plan. So I think the first one is something we've talked about a lot and that's carefully pick your location and do your market research. Um, the second one is make sure that you have a plan to hire someone. Um, officers are more likely to grant the application if you're going to hire Canadians, if you kind of fall into that uh, category as an entrepreneur rather than someone who's self-employed and is just hiring yourself or your family members. Great, thank you gentlemen for coming in today and for your valuable insights. Thanks Rachman. Thanks for having us, Rahmat. Upcoming next is the Q&A session, and I'll be taking your questions related to business immigration. To stay updated on all things related to Canadian business immigration, check us out on social media. Follow us on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter for the latest news and updates. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell to stay informed about the most recent immigration news, interviews with top immigration specialists, and our weekly live shows. Visit our website at www.sabiravs.com for more information or to book a consultation with our team of experts. I hope you found this insight and analysis uh, helpful and it may help for your business immigration to Canada in the future. Now it's time for your questions. If you have any questions, start typing and I will be here to respond to them as, as, as much as I can. Sometimes I may not be able to respond and I will reserve the question. You need to leave your question as a comment and my team and I will get back to that question and answer that in a written format underneath your comments. By the way, uh, I have a quick favor, a small favor to ask. Most of those who are watching our videos, 84% are not subscribed to our channel. Make sure that you subscribe and it helps us a lot to create more content and it keeps you updated for uh, about our upcoming events or any content that we upload to our channel. Thank you very much. Okay, now any questions from the audience? Uh, let's, let me get to those questions if you have any questions. If there are no questions and you need to time to digest the information you heard today, that's okay. Send us your questions via our contact form on sobirovs.com website. Okay, do we have any questions? I don't think we have any questions. I will wait for five seconds if there, there are no questions. We will say goodbye and wish you the best rest of the week. It's a bit uh, rainy today in Toronto, but I hope it's a better weather in your location. Okay. Uh, there is a question? No. Okay. Great. Thank you very much for attending this live show. See you next week. Take care of yourself.